From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. It may feel like a legislative version of Groundhog Day. The 2014 legislative session will likely be dominated by very familiar topics. 38 studios, pensions, Sakonet River Bridge tolls, taxes, and trying to reverse the nation's highest unemployment rate. But whatever state lawmakers tackle, House Speaker Gordon Fox is hoping it'll be a more warm and fuzzy assembly than last year. The end of the session was sort of turned into a little bit personal, and I like to mean that the members remember that. I mean, as tough as it gets, you have to keep, you have to stay in play. You have to listen to one another. The economy will be top of mind for leadership, especially as they carve out the state's budget. But in an election year, it can get unpredictable on Smith Hill. This week on Newsmakers, a look ahead at the 2014 legislative session with our guests, House Majority Leader Nicholas Mattiello and House Minority Leader Brian Newberry. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, WPRI.com reporter, Ted Nisi. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Um, Thank and you, for our viewers yeah. at home, we have uh, the Democratic my Majority Leader Nicholas Matt Mattiello right uh, to my direct left, and to his left we have Minority Leader Brian Newberry. All right, so we have a lot to talk about here, 38 studios, pensions, tolls, but I think we should begin uh, with the, the biggest topic at hand, and that is the economy, and most notably the abysmal unemployment rate. Um, we're still top of the nation here. What are the big ideas here, gentlemen? Leader Mattiello. Well, let me say that we've been working on the economy since I was first elected. We've done pension reform, regulatory reform, tax reform. Uh, we've reinstated historic tax credits. We, we've done a lot of things to work on the economy, but we started from a low place, and I think it's slowly getting better, and we're going to continue working on it. I think in this session we're going to be looking at taxes, corporate taxes, sales taxes, estate taxes and try to come up with a package that best serves our, our state and our, our constituencies. What about corporate taxes? What about sales taxes? Well, sales tax, we have a commission that's studying the issue. It's uh, chaired by Jan Malik. He's doing a good job with it, and we'll see how far we can go. Um, I'd like to see the rate reduced, and from my perspective, I like to be competitive with our neighbors. So I'd like to see us go somewhere in the area of 6.25, 6%, so that we're competitive with Massachusetts and Connecticut. What about the go big or go home idea of getting rid of the sales tax entirely? Well, we'd all like to get rid of the sales tax entirely. I don't think there's anyone that doesn't want to, but we have a government to run, and realistically that's $900 million. So I think you have to look at it from the perspective of if you're going to lose a second largest revenue source, you've got to be able to backfill it. And how do you backfill it? And some folks say that you're going to have increased economic activity, and I suggest that that's probably the case, but I don't believe it'll be $900 million. So what I would suggest is if we're going to, in fact, do that, we have to look at the expense side of the equation and see where we're willing to cut. And I think you have to be specific with that because I like all good things in the budget, and I don't like all bad things in the budget, but we have to be more specific than that. Leader Mattiello, um, the tax I didn't hear you mention is the income tax. We're already hearing, again, liberals in their Democratic caucus wanting to raise income taxes on upper-income Rhode Islanders. Is that on the table? Is that something leadership is considering? Well, the proposal will be there. It's been there every year. I personally believe that you have to have a predictable, stable tax structure. I think we have to encourage high wage earners into the state of Rhode Island. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure how the final debate will end. However, I, I, I personally have always thought that we need stability more than change right now. So I'm probably not in favor of that right now. But we will have folks that are concerned with the budget and concerned with our safety net, and those are all legitimate concerns. So we'll, we'll study it as we do everything else. Leader Newberry, did you hear anything in there you like? Well, I mean, the fundamental, this is my fifth year in the legislature, and I think it's Nick's seventh. And throughout my tenure, the economy of Rhode Island has been one of the worst in the country. That should be our overriding focus. But what does that mean? Why is our economy bad? The heart of the issue is we do not have enough private sector jobs. So how do you attract private sector jobs? You do that by attracting either investment or additional investment from in-state companies and businesses or investment from out-of-state. How do you do that? Well, the government doesn't create jobs. What the government does is set the playing field to allow the private sector to create jobs. We've done an abysmal job in doing that. We've done a few good things over the years to make it better. And there's no one thing, there's no game-changing item that we're going to do. 
what we need to do is take an overall look at our taxes and our regulatory environment and see how we can adjust those. You know, Nick mentioned a couple things um, that I've been in favor of dealing for years. The estate tax, for example, is terrible. It drives people out of state. The corporate tax is high. It doesn't encourage people to invest in the state. What are those things that discourage people? Let's fix that. You know, last year the Senate used the term moving the needle, and I didn't like the substance of what they did very much because I thought it really didn't do much, but the concept was correct. It's not one thing. So we Republicans are going to lay out over the next couple of months a series of initiatives, some of which may dovetail with what the Democrats want to do, some of which may not. But I think that enacted as a whole, would do a lot towards moving the state to a, uh, to a, a situation where private investment would do a better job of creating and, and let me suggest that I, I agree with what Brian suggests, and I think we all want to get to the place where we have a better economy and more jobs. Um, the devil's always in the details. You, we want to lower taxes, and I, want, I would like to lower all three of them to make us more competitive with our neighbors, encourage investment, encourage high wage earners to come here and to stay here to create companies and so forth. However, you have to look at the impact on the budget and other services that we have to provide to our citizens. So it's a balancing act. And that I sounded think like a big but to me. I would like to lower all three of them, but so does that mean it's going to have to be one, not the others? Can you see a scenario in which all three of those taxes are going to be lowered in Rhode Island? I, absolutely. I could see a scenario. I'm not suggesting it's in fact going to happen, but I'm certainly going to look at and encourage a combination of all three so that we, we best serve the economy. And what's the best combination of all three, taking into consideration the services that we have to provide to the state and, and its contingent uh, uh, constituencies? We'll see what that is. But uh, we agree on the goals. We agree on what we want to do. You just have to figure out exactly how we best get there. I want to add something to that. You know, the problem with government in general, and not the Rhode Island state government, it's not unique to Rhode Island, is that there's this attitude that if we spent money the year before, we need to spend money now, okay? As you know, I'm a lawyer, I work for a law firm, we have something like 100 employees. And during the last four or five years, as the economy has not been doing well overall, we've had to make various cuts, and each year we do a budget. And we look at what we spent last year, we look at what we want to budget for, and there's things that we decide, you know what, do we really need to spend that? Is there gonna be a loss if we cut it out of our budget? Yeah, there will be, but what's it offset by? Government doesn't operate that way enough, it should. I mean, one of the concepts I'd like to push, and we've pushed it in the past, is zero-based budgeting, which is, I don't want to get in the bore of the audience, but the idea is instead of saying we spent X dollars on the Department of XYZ last year, we have to start with that as a baseline. We have to stop treating it like that. Once we do that, then we can find the savings to justify, quote-unquote, paying for tax cuts or investments in other things that might be more productive. Zero-based budgeting, I'll go to a different sexy yeah. topic, pensions. Um, <laughs> I want to ask both of you to weigh in, and I'm going to ask Leader Mattiello first on the pension lawsuit that's happening right now. I know it's a big discussion up there. For viewers at home, uh, there have been over a year of secret court-ordered talks that between the unions, Treasurer Mundo, Governor Chafee, to resolve the suit. But lawmakers haven't been part of the discussion uh, in the room on that settlement. And Leader Matty Ellen, have you talked uh, among the leadership about how much more money you'd be willing to put in as a legislature into the pension fund if they have some settlement that rolls back some of the law? I mean, what, I guess what's the thinking right now among the Democratic leadership about how to deal with this? Well, right now, we have, you're correct, we haven't been part of the discussion. Uh, I think we've passed a comprehensive uh, pension reform bill. Um, it's sustainable, it's predictable, it's, it's sound. Um, in order to even consider any changes, it'd have to be measured against that rubric, and it, it would have to be affordable, sustainable. We'd have to know what the cost is. And right now, as of now, the Speaker and the Senate President have been very, very um, firm on this, and, and that we have a sound system right now. And, We'll, we'll see what they propose and we'll, we'll look at what they propose and, and uh, consider it, uh, but we have no ideas. Other than hearing rumors all through the summer, we have no ideas what, what, we're, gonna, what we're gonna receive and what the suggestions are gonna be. There's gonna be costs attributable to that, both to the state and to the municipalities. And unless we can figure out in a diff very difficult year how you're gonna backfill that cost, it's gonna be a very difficult thing to consider. Leader Newberry, you've been pretty uh, clear that you think this whole process is bizarre. Briefly, why? I do a lot of construction litigation in my private practice. I know mediation. Mediation is a great tool to resolve private disputes in court. But the one thing every successful mediation has 
is it has all the parties who can make the final decisions <clears throat> in the room. Here, the final decision can only be made by the legislature. We're not part of the process. Whether or not you think we should even be mediating at all is not the point. We're not part of the process. There's rumors flying even as we do this show that might be an imminent settlement. Who knows? But when that settlement comes forward, we have to approve it or not. And how can we approve something that is agreed to without the idea of the ability to make changes? And just the politics of it are going to be crazy. And you, go ahead. And you have to remember, the, the first time we addressed pension reform was a long process. We actually did it in the off session. We put countless time to that. In this session, I think everybody agrees we want to look at jobs and the economy. We have new members that have never dealt with pension reform, reform before. And it's not a matter of up or down vote on whatever is proposed. Once you put a bill on the floor, it opens up uh, the possibilities of amendments, and I'm sure we'll get amendments. And that is a very significant task to deal with something that significant. And it's going to be hard to even consider doing that in a year that we have to look at jobs in the economy, and that's what we intend on doing. Let me just quickly add to that. It's a good example. Someone reaches a deal. The, the union plaintiffs, the negotiators for the governor and the treasurer, they make, they make a deal. They send it to us. If we change it at all, then the good faith that went into that settlement by them goes out the window. So they're going to, one side or the other is going to feel betrayed, depending on what we do. On the other hand, if we simply rubber stamp what they did, we're abdicating our responsibilities as legislators. That's why I say the process is bizarre. Frankly, I think the court orders rule one way or the other, and it's going to get appealed no matter what Could happens. you ignore it? Could the oh, legislature yeah. ignore it? The, the what, what happens then? What happens? Yeah. The court has to make a decision. Yeah, the court action just continues. Yeah, I, gotta tell you, I, can't speak for, I can't speak for the Democratic leadership. I can't speak for the Speaker of the House. But it would not surprise me if there were a settlement, if it were ignored. That's wow. all. I mean, that's just my, my impression, but who knows? I mean, it's not my, not my call. Yeah, and, and that wouldn't shock me either. I, I mean, obviously. Which saying since you were the de majority leader. Obviously, you have to look at the content of the proposed settlement. And as of right now, we have no idea what it is. So this is all speculation. I mean, uh, we, we enjoy thinking about it and talking about it and analyzing it, but it's all speculation. We have no idea what they're even talking about. I want to wrap up this conversation with sort of a minor issue on this. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Dominic Ruggiero proposed legislation that would prohibit paying for legal fees in the state's defense of the 2011 pension changes from the actual retirement fund, if you follow. Um, do you support that? I haven't given it much thought. I'm not sure that the way we're paying for it is inappropriate. When you measure it against the entire fund, it's probably an insignificant, it is an insignificant sum, and that may be a good place that we're currently paying it from, but we'll take a look well, at it. You as both we do know how issues. lawyers can charge fees, I think. <laughs> uh, and actually, one other question. I heard Governor Chafee tell Ian Donis from uh, Rhode Island Public Radio that he's concerned the law wouldn't hold up in court and supports, he's always supported mediation. Um, do you agree with the governor? I mean, he's almost kind of saying that m maybe the law isn't constitutional. Do you agree with him? Uh, I wouldn't have voted for a law I thought was unconstitutional. And while I cannot predict what either the trial judge or really doesn't even, no, no disrespect to the trial judge, it really doesn't matter what the trial judge does. Yeah. It matters what the Round Supreme Court does. I'd be very surprised at the end of the day if the Round Supreme Court found this law unconstitutional. I, I actually agree with that. I, I think that when we pass the law, uh, we pass something that we thought would survive a challenge. We all anticipated a challenge. So I, my opinion is the courts should make a decision. That's, that's uh, the function they serve in society. And if ultimately the Supreme Court finds that the law is unconstitutional, we, we would have to, of course, deal with that. But I, I'm willing to let it be tested in court, and I believe that what we passed was, in fact, constitutional. Well, there's been way too much agreement between the two of you on the show so far, but <laughs> we'll, we'll end we, that in a second. <laughs> that's right, because when we come back, uh, two important topics to talk about 38 studios in the Sakonic River Bridge Toll. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is House Majority Leader Nicholas Mattiello and House Minority Leader Brian Newberry. Gentlemen, we're going to talk about 38 Studios. And Leader Mattiello, we'll start with you. You were part of the leadership team in the House, as you are now, now when the law was passed to extend, expand, excuse me, the job guarantee program that ultimately funded 38 Studios. This is the what did you know, when did you know it question, right? Um, Every lawmaker comes on the show and says they just passed this program and had no idea that this amount of money was going to go to Curt Schilling's business. Is that your line? That's the reality of the situation. When, 
when members come on this show or any other show or make any statement saying they didn't know, they did not know. I, as the House Majority Bob Leader... Bob Watson seemed to know, didn't he? I mean, he gave that almost soothsayer speech during that vote, talking about what a mistake it was. Well, but Bob Watson didn't know specifically. Bob Watson oftentimes, and to his credit, in this case, sometimes was the lone dissenting vote. And in this case, it was the same thing. I was voting for a job guarantees program, as all of our membership was, it, um, a loan guarantee program. Because if you remember, at that time, the banking crisis was in full swing, and banks weren't lending money. Our companies couldn't get access to capital. So to me and the rest of the membership, it seemed like a natural fit. It seemed like a good thing to do. I advocated for a loan guarantee program on the floor. And I still think a loan guarantee program would have been an appropriate thing to do. It should have been given out in smaller increments to more companies, and it should not have all been given to 38 studios. That vetting process took place in the EDC, and I'm not sure how they were, you know, how good or bad they vetted this, but it seems to me that there's a lot of blame to go around, and it lies within the EDC, and uh, they didn't do their due diligence. You know, f fair or not, uh, a lot of people don't buy the, the statement that you, uh, legislators didn't know how much was going, but particularly when it comes from House Speaker Gordon Fox. I mean, he has said, look, yeah, we knew Kurt Schilling was interested, but we didn't know, it was, I didn't know it was going to be $75 million. Have you talked to the Speaker about it? We, we have lots of different discussions about that specifically, no. Uh, I can tell you that Governor Kacheri, and, and I, I was always try to be fair to the Governor, but he, he accepted responsibility for pushing this. He actually said the legislature did the right thing. They did their job. I wanted the program passed. They did their job. And that's not an exact quote, but pretty close to what he said. Yeah, and he said that on, on this program. I, I remember that. Did, but what about the call for an independent investigation, just to make sure all of that is, is accurate? Um, should well, I, there I, be one? There should always be in investigations of anything, and I believe this was investigated. I'm, I'm not certain, but I believe the state police investigated it. I believe the federal government, took, uh, the FBI, took a look at it, and everybody determined there was no, no wrongdoing, no criminal wrongdoing, certainly. And a look at criminality can be very different than the legislative process. Uh, there might not have been any laws broken, but certainly people are hungry for the truth for, for that reason. Should there be an independent investigation outside the General Assembly? You have to balance the need for information, and, and I believe through oversight and so forth, and, and the civil lawsuit that's going on now, which I think has to take priority over every, and everything, and I'm, I'm concerned about interfering with the civil lawsuit because the state has a lot at risk there. But the need for information has to be balanced against the cost of it. Um, there, there's a bill floating around or that I expect to be floating around that we'll take a look at. But what I'm concerned, I'm concerned with growing jobs, growing the economy, looking forward in the state and being productive. I don't think it serves us well with a negative story in the front page of the paper or on your show every, every week. Um, I think we have to start concentrating on the positive in our state and moving forward in a positive direction. We absolutely need information and we need to know what happened and what went wrong. And I think most people have the information and, and know where the problems lie. We made a lot of corrections. Um, when we did the historical tax credits, we, we in fact limited them at $5 million so that you wouldn't be giving them to any one single project. We did away with the loan guarantee program. So, we, we restructured the EDC. It's now going to be the Commerce Department. So we, we looked at a lot of the problems that occurred, and we've already taken corrective actions. Now, is more information always better? Absolutely. I would just want to balance that against the cost of getting all that information and what we're going to be concentrating on. For my viewpoint, I want to concentrate on the future. I want to concentrate on making our state better. I want to concentrate on jobs and the economy. And that's, that's where my focus will generally be. I want to ask you both briefly, should the state pay the, and I'll start with you, Leader Newberry, the $12.5 million uh, that taxpayers are supposed to put in this year for the bondholders from 38 Studios? No. And last year, when the first question came out, the $2.5 million, I said to my staff, I said, listen, we have to make a decision. I want to make the right decision. If the right decision is to pay it, that's fine, but I need to be able to justify and explain that to my constituents. If the right decision is not to pay it, same thing. 
They did an investigation to the extent they could, an analysis. They produced it. I know you've seen it. I published it June 18th of last year. It's laid out all the reasons why we shouldn't pay it. Not that there won't be a drawback to not paying it, but that the drawback to not paying it is a lot less than the drawback to paying it. And I said, I said to the Democratic leadership, I said, listen, if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. You know, give me an analysis that counters this. Here we are in January. We still don't have an analysis that counters it. So if someone comes forward and can convince me that we should pay it, I'll do it. But right now, the only evidence I've seen says we should not pay it. So as of now, no, absolutely we should not pay it. Your thoughts, Mavir? Well, Lita Newberry's analysis and, my, and mine are, are pretty similar. I, I would say let's see. In the last budget, we promised an analysis that we don't have yet. We appropriated $50,000 for an RFP to, to study the issue. Um, evidently, that's not enough money. There were no takers. So we're going to have to expand that search. We're going to have to either increase the amount of funding for the study or maybe go to a university with a good economics department and so forth. But there's drawbacks on either side. Twelve and a half million dollars is a lot of money. Our constituents work very hard for, for their tax dollars and we have to appropriate them very wisely and intelligently and prudently. So I, I, I in fact want to do that, but there is a draw. So in order to convince me that we should make that kind of payment, I need solid ev evidence to do that. I haven't seen that evidence yet, but there is a drawback to not paying it. So I want to see an analysis, and I'm not an expert in that area. I'm going to wait to see a, an expert's analysis, and then, like I make all of my other decisions, make it as informed as I can. I'm just not there yet. Before we go to tolls, I have to ask you a little about politics, Leader Mattiello. Uh, Gordon Fox has said he's going to run again and seek to be speaker again next year, but we assume at some point he will not live forever and he will no longer be the speaker of the House. Uh, are you interested in being the next speaker? Yes, I am. I support, um, I support Gordon Fox. I think he's done a good job. If you look at a lot of the reforms that we've done um, in his uh, tenure, uh, we've done pension reform, uh, funding formula reform for the, the uh, uh, education, uh, regulatory reform, tax reform. We've done significant things. Uh, Speaker Fox has done a lot of good things. So I support Speaker Fox. I will continue to support him as long as he wants to be Speaker. When he decides to retire from the position, I am in fact interested and I'm honored that my name comes up every now and then. Leader uh, Mattiello, we'll stick with you. In the waning hours of last session, you were able to pass a bill that would keep tolls on the Sakonet, uh River Bridge, but they were at 10 cents. It was kind of a, you know, a placeholder so lawmakers could study the issue of tolling and there was this belief that if you didn't do it the option would would go away there uh... so here we are now you're, you started the session again it's going to come up people are being charged that ten cents it's prediction time i guess actually for both of you are tolls here to stay and obviously at a, at a higher cost what do you think well we have a commission studying it so like all issues let's take a look at the evidence and and let's see but i will tell you i, I I argued for the placeholder. It's um, it's in fact in place at ten cents. So I, I don't think there's any prejudice to anyone except uh, the states allowed to maintaining the tolling. Sh should we find that that's the best thing to do? However, it's a very difficult issue. The folks on the East Bay make a valid point. We're one state, and that would be the only place in the state for tolling. In a session where we're going to concentrate on jobs in the economy, I'm concerned about the extra costs that would be imposed on the, the side of the state, the East Bay. So I'm becoming very sensitive to the concerns of the East Bay, and uh, I, I would be a little skeptical at this point about imposing a toll. However, like every issue that I deal with, uh, that our body deals with, I think we have to look at the evidence. Uh, um, uh, we have uh, a commission that's working. Let's take a look at their report and we'll take it from there. But I do believe that we have to be very, very, very sensitive to the cost that will be imposed on that side of the state. Leader Newberg? Are you predicting, are you asking me whether I predict the tolls will go up? Yeah. My prediction, and I know people in the East Bay may not want to hear this, just my prediction, not what I necessarily want to see happen, is that the tolls will in fact go up. And the reason I say that is very simple. It, by default, they're going to go up, come, and I misspoke on another show, a competitor show a couple weeks ago, but it's in April, and that means we have to act in some capacity to prevent them from going in effect to the full value of whatever the Bridge and Turnpike Authority wanted by April. Uh, I have doubts that that will happen, uh, partly just the inertia of the legislature, and partly because in order for the toll, see, we're all paying the price for the poor way infrastructure has been funded in the state for decades. We can go into all kinds of reasons why the blame for that lies, but we're dealing with the reality of what we have now. And the tolls with the Bridge and Turnpike's Authority attempt to deal with that problem. 
agree or disagree, that's their attempt. We need to find a, a, another solution to that problem. As a matter of politics, as much as I don't like the tolls, I don't live in the East Bay. So am I going to raise, vote to raise taxes on the constituents in my part of the state in order to offset that? That's a difficult vote, not just for me. It's a difficult vote for Leader Mattiello, who's in Cranston, or anybody who's not affected by it. And people in the East Bay are not going to want to hear what I just said. But that's the political reality. The tolls are there. So we need to affirmatively stop them. The time to stop this from going up was when they were initially passed. I think the political reality is I think they're probably going to go up. If I'm wrong, I, I'm happy to see it. Well, I, I'm not... Uh, 15 seconds later. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bet either way on that. I, I, like I, I indicated my concerns, and uh, Leader Newberry is correct. It's sometimes difficult to undo things. However, we're all sensitive to the, the East Bay's uh, concerns. Leader Mattiello, Leader Newberry, thank you very much for joining us. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.